support and I'm really, got it. Thank you, Siri. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to share uh, my work with you. I'm excited to tell you today about um, a couple of projects I've been working on, one from my PhD on predator-prey interactions and some really new work coming out of my postdoc. Uh, so most broadly, I'm really interested in the interactions among species. So here I'm showing you uh, some examples of pairwise interactions between species, and they sort of span a continuum from more antagonistic, like between predator and prey or host and pathogen, to more beneficial or mutualisms, like between uh, plant and pollinator or host and endosymbiont. And these interactions among species are the fabric that connects ecological communities, right? They connect and structure ecological communities, and they're thought to be really important drivers of the evolution of biodiversity. I am sort of broadly really interested in how coevolutionary relationships develop over time in these pairwise interactions between species like predator and prey or host uh, and, and endosymbiont. Uh, and I think studying these interactions from an evolutionary standpoint is really compelling because uh, the agent of selection is another organism that's also capable of undergoing adaptive evolution. So in many instances, organisms are trying to adapt to sort of another organism that's a moving target. And this can generate really uh, rapid uh, adaptation and counter-adaptation co-evolutionary dynamics that lead to rapid evolutionary change and adaptation over time. So uh, we can think about co-evolution sort of broadly across different levels of biological scale. <clears throat> and if we think of just a simple example between co-evolutionary relationship between predator and prey, or at the opposite end of the continuum, post and endosymbiont, sort of starting at the most uh, macroscopic scale, you can imagine thinking about co-evolution at sort of the phylogenetic uh, scale, where if you were to look at the evolutionary history of uh, predator and prey or host and endosymbiont, and if you see this pattern of co-divergence um, and co-speciation between these two co-evolving uh, organisms, you might infer they have this sort of extended evolutionary history or co-evolutionary relationship. Zooming in to a particular lineage, maybe a tip on this phylogeny, thinking about variation within species across the landscape. So you can imagine you've got co-evolving populations um, scattered across the landscape, and you would expect within species co-evolutionary dynamics to sort of vary from one population to the next. Some populations you might have intense reciprocal co-evolution. Other populations might exist in allopatry of their co-evolving partner, but generally we expect to see variation across the landscape from one population to the next in co-evolutionary dynamics. If we zoom in even further to sort of the level of an individual population, what are the actual traits in predator and prey or host and endosymbiont that mediate the outcome of interactions between those two species? And specifically you get co-evolutionary dynamics uh, when the fitness or success of one organism depends not only on the trait value of its own species, but also the combination of that trait with its co-evolving partner. But generally, if you zoom into sort of the population level, what are the actual traits that mediate interactions between species like predator and prey or host and endosymbiont? And then finally, what's the cellular and genetic basis of those traits that mediate interactions between species. If you zoom all the way down to the sort of the level of cells and proteins, what are the physical interactions between these two co-evolving species that mediate interactions uh, and the outcome of interactions between species at the population level? So uh, generally sort of my goal across my PhD and my postdoc has really been to integrate our understanding of co-evolution across these different levels of biological scale. Uh, so today, what I wanna focus on is how does evolution at this molecular interface of species interactions, when you drill all the way down to the cellular and molecular level, what does that tell us about broader patterns of co-evolution at the population, landscape, and species scale? So today I'm gonna uh, have two parts to this, this talk, one from my PhD on predator-prey interactions, uh, and one uh, detailing some very new work coming out of my postdoc on relationships between hosts uh, and Wolbachia, this really common endosymbiont. <clears throat> okay, so first I'm gonna uh, focus on my P some of my PhD work and tell you a story about 
uh, coevolution between predator and prey, but we're going to start on sort of this antagonistic end of this continuum. Um, so antagonistic interactions between host and pathogen, host and parasite, or predator and prey uh, can generate really intense reciprocal selection between natural enemies, which can drive really rapid coevolutionary dynamics. And for example, that can be characterized by red queen dynamics, like negative frequency dependent selection between host and pathogen, or arms race coevolutionary dynamics. And that's what I want to talk about today. And these coevolutionary arms races between natural enemies typically involve uh, some sort of predatory ability of a predator and a, an ability of the prey to defend against that uh, predation. And these are typically for, for quantitative traits where essentially more is better in these arms races. So you can imagine you start at some ancestral low level of predatory ability and prey defensive ability. And essentially, uh, escalation in one species is met by counter escalation in another species. And this drives this arms race escalation of prey and predator traits. And this escalation can sort of continue until some sort of cost uh, or trade-off is met uh, in the process of this intense arms race coevolution of particular phenotypes. So today I want to tell you about perhaps one of the most uh, well-studied examples of a coevolutionary arms race. And this is a system that I worked on for my PhD between toxic newts and their resistant predators, garter snakes. Uh, so these newts occur on the west coast of North America, newts in the genus uh, Tarika, Pacific newts, and they contain tetrodotoxin, uh, or TTX for short. And this is this really potent, deadly neurotoxin. It's the same toxin that uh, pufferfish carry, or fugu. So if you've ever eaten fugu, it's why you get that sort of tingly sensation on your tongue. It's also why you have to be really careful when you prepare uh, fugu, because this toxin, tetrodotoxin, is very deadly. And it deters most predators. However, garter snakes, multiple species of garter snake, including the common garter snake, which I'll talk about today, have evolved uh, extreme resistance to this toxin as a result of this coevolutionary arms race and can uh, consume even highly toxic newts indicated by this uh, coevolutionary interaction right here. So I wanna start at kind of the, the landscape scale of this coevolutionary relationship between newts and garter snakes. So here I'm showing you a heat map of the range where newts and snakes co-occur on the west coast in California, Oregon, and Washington. And hot colors indicate high levels of new TTX in, in populations of newts, uh, and cool colors indicate lower ancestral levels of TTX. And similarly on the right here, we have uh, pattern population variation and levels of snake resistance up and down the coast. Hot colors indicate highly resistant snakes. And if you look at these two maps and you sort of squint, you'll notice that they look uh, pretty correlated across the landscape, right? We see these hot spots of escalated uh, prey toxins and predator resistance in California and the Pacific Northwest. And in fact, if you zoom in and do sort of fine scale sampling uh, in these two, two regions and look at clinal variation in new TTX and snake resistance in each of these regions, there's this really tight clinal match in levels of prey toxins and predator resistance. And this pattern of phenotypic matching is presumably due to intense arms race coevolution in these two different regions in California and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so today I'm gonna to focus on these two hot spots of escalation in this arms race, call them hot spots of arms race coevolution in the Pacific Northwest and California. And I'm gonna focus, I've done some work trying to understand what drives variation in levels of new TTX across the landscape. But today I'm going to focus on how garter snakes have evolved escalated resistance to this toxin in their prey in these two different regions in uh, the Pacific Northwest in California. Uh, so now I want to sort of zoom down to the cellular and molecular level and tell you a little bit about how tetrodotoxin uh, acts on sodium channels. So it acts on voltage-gated sodium channels, including the NAV14 skeletal muscle sodium channel, which is expressed in muscle tissue. And these sodium channels, here's just kind of a cute little cartoon of these sodium channels. They have this pore region that allows the selective influx of sodium ions. And this is obviously really critical for the propagation of action potentials in, in muscle and nerve tissue. Newts contain 
tetrodotoxin, which is the small molecule that binds to the pore region of the channel and prevents the influx of sodium ions uh, in the propagation of action potentials. And this is obviously very deleterious if you're trying to do things like use muscles to breathe after eating a toxic newt. Garter snakes have specific amino acid changes in the pore that disrupt the binding of tetrodotoxin and confer large increases in resistance. So here I'm just showing you a different schematic, a different way to look at this channel. You can imagine if you kind of sliced it down the middle and unrolled it, it would look something like this. So it's got these four domains, D1, 2, 3, and 4. And this darkened region is the outer pore that uh, interacts with tetrodotoxin. And in the common garter snake, there's specific amino acid changes in the fourth domain pore loop that have been shown uh, through a lot of really beautiful work uh, <clears throat> before I started this project to confer large increases in resistance to the channel. So here I'm showing you the four alleles uh, that have been observed in common garter snakes when I first started this project during my PhD. Um, this is the ancestral sequence, which I'm going to color code purple. And then I've got these alleles color coded up to red of increasing resistance. Uh, and they've got an increasing number of amino acid changes in these alleles. And through a lot of uh, really beautiful functional expression work uh, and work on muscle tissue, it's been shown that these alleles confer increasing levels of resistance to the sodium channel, uh, snake skeletal muscle tissue, and that's highly correlated with organismal levels or phenotypic levels of resistance um, in garter snakes. So we've got these four unique alleles, three of them are derived in the common garter snake. And when I first started this project, uh, during my PhD, <clears throat> these four alleles had been identified in four different uh, locations on the West Coast from four different snakes. This ancestral sequence is identified in Idaho outside the range of toxic newts. Um, and then these two alleles, this blue and orange allele, was found in the Pacific Northwest hotspot. And this highly resistant red allele with four cumulative amino acid changes was found in the California hotspot. So this was four alleles from four individual snakes. And we didn't really know how these two different lineages of highly resistant snakes in California and the Pacific Northwest actually convergently evolved phenotypic resistance. So one question I wanted to ask when I first started this project was, have garter snakes in each of these lineages in California and the Pacific Northwest evolved escalated phenotypic resistance by a similar set of parallel changes in the pore of the channel? What's the sequence of amino acid changes that led to escalated resistance in each of these regions? So to, to answer that question, uh, I went up and down the coast and just sampled frequencies of these different alleles in populations that co-occur with toxic newts to test what sort of frequency at which these alleles occur at. And also, are there other intermediate, sorry, our, our uh, lab dog is next door barking. But uh, the goal here was to look at what's the frequency of these alleles up and down the coast? Uh, and are there other intermediate alleles that might exist telling us how these evolved escalated resistance in each lineage? So here I'm showing you pie charts, which indicate inf um, <clears throat> allele frequencies of these different alleles up and down the coast. And I'll just kind of highlight a few general patterns that, that popped out here, but first, sort of the presence of these more resistant derived alleles is tightly correlated with uh, geographic patterns of phenotypic resistance. So the resistance alleles are found in hot spots. The ancestral alleles are found in cold in the cold spot in between uh, these two hot spots in, in Northern California. What was most interesting was this highly resistant red allele was unique to California. It's only found in California. And this resistant orange allele with two amino acid changes is unique to the Pacific Northwest. It's only found there. But this isoleucine to valine change in this blue allele is found in uh, both hotspots in California and the Pacific Northwest. And as you move between these two hotspots, you only find the ancestral sequence. So this suggests that uh, potentially this isoleucine to valine change arose independently in each of these lineages and then went on to more resistant uh, but unique alleles in each lineage. So to sort of more rigorously test that, we wanted to build a gene tree of the sodium channel and reconstruct the sequence of amino acid changes in the channel through time in each of these lineages. 
So here I'm showing you the gene tree for NAB14, and I'm just showing you a subset of the tree, which I'm happy to talk about uh, later. But in fact, we find this evidence of a repeated first step to toxin resistance in each of these lineages, where in California and the Pacific Northwest, so these two distinct clades for the gene tree, and it seems like this isoleucine to valine change arose independently in each of these lineages and then went on to more resistant but unique alleles uh, in each region. And this is sort of generally consistent with the overall population history of garter snakes in the West. So here I'm showing you a population tree using some DDRAD-seq data of a bunch of uh, unlinked SNPs. And then here's a structure plot just to show you that as you move up the coast from California to Oregon to Washington, the California-Oregon border along the coast is uh, a site of differentiation between southern and northern lineages. And this is kind of consistent with a lot of uh, organisms in the West where this California-Oregon border is sort of a site of historical vicariance and a site of differentiation for many organisms moving up the coast from California to Oregon to Washington. So what we think happened is within each of these distinct garter snake lineages in the south and the north, garter snakes independently evolved escalated resistance via this repeated first step mutation in the channel pore. And that's just kind of summarized here by all these data. So the next kind of obvious question is, well, why do you see this really striking pattern of parallel evolution where the same amino acid change seems to have arisen multiple times in the same region of the channel. Well, one potential explanation is the, uh, the rest of the channel is under quite a bit of functional constraint due to its really important critical function in propagating action potentials in muscle tissue. In particular, this poor region where these toxin resistant mutations arise is really criti critical for sort of mediating the selective influx of sodium ions and the opening and closing of this channel in the process of propagating action potentials. And I showed you this kind of this cute little cartoon of this channel, but it looks something more like this. So this is a, a surface representation of this protein looking down at the pore, kind of where this arrow is pointed. And what's immediately clear when you look at these uh, surface representations of, of your favorite protein is that the structure of proteins is incredibly complex. It's determined by all these um, interactions among different um, amino acid residues, and there's intramolecular epistasis. And that complex structure ultimately determines the function of the protein. So it's really easy to imagine how if you changed a few amino acids in a really critical region of the channel, that might beneficially disrupt toxin binding, but it might also have deleterious effects due to uh, pleiotropy and epistasis. Uh, within the sodium channel. So we hypothesize that you might get this trade-off between mutations that disrupt toxin binding at the pore, but also have negative consequences for sort of overall sodium channel function. So to test this question, I worked with another graduate student at the time, Gabby Toledo, and she functionally expressed these different um, TTX resistant uh, alleles in Xenopus O sites and measured how resistant are the channels and what are some characteristics of sort of their baseline function? So she tested these three different alleles, the ancestral, the isoleucine to valine change, and the highly resistant allele with four amino acid changes found in California. And she looked at how resistant is the channel. So here's just the amount of tetrodotoxin on the x-axis required to block half of uh, the channels. So this is a measure of how resistant the, um, the channel is. And then she looked at the voltage dependence of activation when the channels open and then when they close. And this window under the uh, sort of the, the gist of what you need to know here is the, the window under these two curves of the activation and fast inactivation curve represents roughly sort of the excitability of the channel and the process of action potential propagation. As the membrane becomes depolarized, what's the window at which the channel is open? and then close. So this is kind of a rough measure of how excitable the channel is. So here are the data for the ancestral sequence. And then we looked at this isoleucine to valine change, which confers a slight increase in resistance. And this window under these two curves is largely un unchanged. There's a slight change in the voltage dependence of fast inactivation, but largely unchanged. 
So then we looked at this highly resistant uh, allele with four cumulative amino acid changes. And we see this really dramatic increase in toxin resistance of the channel. It just takes a ton of TTX to block these channels. But that's coupled with this really dramatic decrease in window current, this area under this curve. And that's due to this shift of voltage dependence of activation towards more depolarized membranes. But essentially, this can be sort of interpreted as a reduction in the excitability of the channel that's coupled, coupled with an increase in resistance. And there are genetic disorders in humans that have sort of a similar phenotype that result in muscle weakness in, in humans. So this is evidence at sort of the protein level for antagonistic pleiotropy associated with these mutations. So we find evidence for this trade-off at sort of the protein level. How might that scale to the organismal level? Well, this might confer the ability of resistant snakes to consume highly toxic newts, but it might also simultaneously have negative effects on muscle function and specifically the ability of these snakes to crawl. So next we wanted to test for a trade-off between how resistant a snake is and uh, how quickly it can crawl. So we reared a ton of snakes in the lab. So these were snakes born in the lab from wild caught females that were caught in the field um, pregnant. So they were born in the lab and they weren't exposed to postnatal selection. And we ran each of these neonates on a racetrack. And this was done by Butch Brody Jr. at Utah State University, who's a bit of an icon himself, cigar and all, he's always got his cigar. And he raced each of these snakes on this racetrack to see how fast uh, each snake crawled. And then we related to the, that to whether or not it had these resistant mutations in its sodium channel. So here I'm going to show you the data. First, we analyzed the Pacific Northwest hotspot, and then we organize, uh, analyzed the California lineage separately. So if you look at uh, the different alleles in the Pacific Northwest, there's no difference in crawl speed between the ancestral, the I to V change, and the orange allele. So no evidence for a trade-off. But when we look in California and we see this highly resistant allele that shows evidence at the molecular level for antagonistic pleiotropy, snakes that have that are homozygous for that highly resistant allele have significantly reduced crawl speed compared to snakes with the ancestral um, channel. So this is pretty striking because it suggests this trade-off we can detect at sort of the protein level scales all the way up to the organismal level and produces this trade-off between resistance and crawl speed. And the fitness implications of a reduction in crawl speed are sort of really easy to imagine from the garter snake's perspective. So this is a, a picture of a snake that I found when I was doing field work. And you'll notice here, it's missing a big chunk of its dorsum. And I think this just sort of illustrates the importance of crawl speed for garter snakes and their ability to evade their own predators, particularly birds and mammals. So what we think is going on is these mutations in the channel generate uh, this trade-off between the ability of garter snakes to prey on toxic newts, but also their own ability to avoid predators. Okay, so now I wanna kind of wrap up this section. So arms race coevolution has led to the uh, extreme escalation of garter snake resistance and new TTX uh, in two separate lineages in California and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and in the process of garter snakes evolving escalated resistance uh, in response to their toxic prey, trade-offs seem to arise due to uh, the functional constraint, the, the overall importance of this poor region of the channel. So trade-offs arise in the process of arms race coevolution. Uh, and these functional constraints in the channel seem to bias the evolutionary trajectory of predators towards parallel outcomes. So in each of these lineages, we see this repeated first step to toxin resistance. And perhaps this initial uh, step is permissive in that it uh, enables future changes that are more resistant to the channel without completely disrupting sodium channel function. But more broadly, we think um, uh, antagonistic pleiotropy and the sort of the overall functional constraints associated with the poor region of this channel lead to highly parallel uh, mutations arising in the, ch in the channel of multiple lineages of garter snakes. Okay, now for something uh, slightly different, but I want to return to this idea of trying to integrate our understanding 
of co-evolution across these different levels of biological scale. And just to remind you for this talk, I'm really interested in this question of what happens, what can we learn about the co-evolutionary process when we zoom down to sort of the cellular molecular basis of traits that mediate interactions between species. And now we're gonna move on to some new work that's coming out of my postdoc research that I'm really excited to tell you about um, on relationships between hosts and their endosymbionts. So now we're just gonna kind of move to the opposite end of this spectrum of species interactions to beneficial relationships, in particular, uh, those between hosts and their endosymbionts. And this is perhaps the most intimate form of interaction between two species because you have microbes residing within the cells of their animal host. And these endosymbioses can have really profound effects on the, on the fitness of their hosts. They can influence how hosts acquire nutrients, how hosts reproduce, the thermal tolerance of their hosts, and ultimately uh, host fitness. On sort of a broader evolutionary timescale, these endosymbiotic relationships are also what eventually gave rose to the proliferation of eukaryotes, right? So the acquisition of organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts. Insects in particular seem to host a lot of endosymbionts. And today I wanna to tell you about uh, what's the focus of my postdoctoral research, which is Wolbachia, the most common endosymbiont that we know of on earth. So Wolbachia infect about half of all insect species that we know of. Uh, on Earth. So here's just a tree of different Wolbachia lineages and all the hosts that they infect. They also infect other arthropods and some nematodes. And Wolbachia are intracellular uh, bacteria. So here I'm showing you these little fluorescent puncta uh, are Wolbachia cells inside a developing host oocyte. And Wolbachia are maternally transmitted uh, in the cytoplasm from mom to offspring along with the mitochondria. If you've heard anything about Wolbachia, you've probably heard that they manipulate their host's reproduction to favor their own spread. And the most sort of famous example of that is cytoplasmic incompatibility, or I might refer to it as CI as an abbreviation. Uh, and this generates this incompatibility where if a female is uninfected with Wolbachia and she mates with a Wolbachia infected male, she experiences cytoplasmic incompatibility or a reduction in egg hatch but that's rescued if females are infected. So infected females can both mate with infected males and uh, uninfected males. And this creates uh, an advantage for females to be infected that can cause Wolbachia to spread really rapidly through host populations. Uh, so Wolbachia generally for most hosts are uh, facultative from the host perspective. So hosts don't require Wolbachia to survive, although Wolbachia can't survive uh, outside of host cells because they're this intracellular endosymbiont. Um, and many infected host species are characterized by uh, variation in the prevalence of Wolbachia uh, among different populations of hosts. So this is an, a new example out of the Cooper lab where I'm doing my postdoc of this cute little spittle bug. And uh, my PI, Brandon, insisted on naming this Wolbachia strain W-Pig, but this is a, a strain of Wolbachia that infects spittle bugs. And this is an example um, in Maine and New Hampshire showing infection frequencies of W-Pig Wolbachia in different spittle bug populations. Uh, and, and what you'll see is the prevalence of Wolbachia can vary over very short geographic distances spatially. And then if you also look at the same location uh, you can see variation in infection frequencies across time from year to year. So generally we see a lot of spatial and temporal variation in how common Wolbachia are. And this has important implications for how Wolbachia ultimately influence host fitness. So one general question I wanna ask for this portion of my talk and what I'm generally interested in uh, in my postdoc research is why does endosymbiont prevalence vary so much among host populations? What drives variation in the prevalence of Wolbachia within and among host species? So one really uh, critical determinant of how common uh, these maternally transmitted endosymbionts are in host populations is how well are they transmitted to the next generation of hosts? So Wolbachia are vertically maternally transmitted 
And this particular trait that contributes to variation in infection frequencies uh, historically hasn't received a lot of focus because typically when you rear infected host species in the lab, rates of vertical maternal transmission to offspring are uh, almost perfect or perfect under sort of ideal lab conditions. But when I first started my postdoc, there was some evidence from the field that suggests this might not be, be the case out in nature. So that would suggest that there's an environmental component that determines how well Wolbachia are transmitted to mom, from mom to offspring. So this was a question I wanted to more rigorously assess uh, in the field. Does rates of maternal transmission from uh, mom to offspring vary in nature? And how might that contribute to variation in the prevalence of Wolbachia in host populations? So in this example, uh, we looked at maternal tra transmission rates of W. yak Wolbachia, which is a strain that infects Drosophila yacuba. And Drosophila yacuba are found on the west coast of Africa, including on uh, this volcanic island uh, called Sao Tome off the coast of West Africa. And we looked at rates of maternal transmission on this volcanic island along this altitudinal climb. We had a site at low altitude and then moving up uh, to high altitude. And we just measured maternal transmission of Wolbachia from mom to offspring in the field under normal environmental conditions to see does transmission vary in nature. And it turns out it does. So this is just the proportion of infected offspring uh, born from infected females. And at low altitude along this climb, we see high, generally high, near perfect rates of maternal transmission to offspring. But as, if you, as you move up in altitude, transmission rates decline quite a bit. So this is pretty interesting because it suggests at least the rate of vertical maternal transmission can vary over pretty short geographic distances with the potential to contribute to variation in infection frequencies. So the next thing we wanted to do was to take flies back to the lab and try and figure out what might be driving this variation in rates of maternal transmission from low and high altitude. So back in Montana, in the lab, the first thing I did was rear flies at sort of standard laboratory conditions at 25 degrees. And as I mentioned earlier, under sort of normal lab conditions, transmission is basically perfect to offspring. There was some evidence in the literature that suggested host diet might influence how well Wolbachia are transmitted to offspring. So we uh, added some yeast to the fly food to see if altering host diet alters rates of maternal transmission. Turns out that had no effect. Again, transmission was near perfect in the lab. And then we started to think a little bit uh, more about this altitudinal climb. And as you move up in altitude along this volcanic island, temperatures generally become cooler. So we thought, well, perhaps if you rear flies at a cooler temperature, that might explain differences in rates of maternal transmission. And in fact, when you drop temperatures five degrees and rear flies in the cold, we see a decline in maternal transmission. And that almost perfectly recapitulates this pattern that we see uh, on Sao Tome. So this was pretty exciting because we were able now to generate trait variation in the lab and really sort of more rigorously uh, try and figure out what might drive variation in maternal transmission in the lab and in nature. It turns out W. yak Wolbachia, which infects Drosophila yacuba, is very closely related to W. mel Wolbachia. They diverged in the last tens of thousands of years. And W. mel Wolbachia is very well studied because it infects Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, and it's also used in some Wolbachia-based biocontrol efforts to combat things like dengue and Zika, which I'm happy to talk about later. W. mel Wolbachia in Drosophila melanogaster exhibits this classic cline where uh, across the continent of Australia, infection frequencies are ge generally high in the north. And then as you move south in latitude, infection frequencies decline. So given what we found with W. yak on, on this volcanic island off the coast of West Africa, I wanted to more broadly ask of whether declining maternal transmission or variation in rates of maternal transmission can explain continental pa patterns of variation in Wolbachia prevalence, particularly this W. mel cline in Drosophila melanogaster. And this sort of fits our expectations for what we saw in, on Sao Tome, because in tropical climates in the north, infection frequencies are high, presumably where transmission is, is higher. And then as you move south to more temperate climates, infection frequencies, 
decline, which could potentially be explained by declining, declining maternal transmission in uh, a more temperate climate. So what I wanted to do was design an experiment to test how temperature uh, alters rates of maternal transmission and can potentially explain this decline in WML infection frequencies. So I just want to kind of walk you quickly through this experiment because it's, it's a little complicated. So this was a three-factor design to test how temperature influences rates of maternal transmission, but we also wanted to test how the host and Wolbachia genomes, the WML genome, also influence variation in rates of maternal transmission. So in the lab, we reared flies at 28, 25, and 20 C, three different temperatures, hot, moderate, and cold. And we sampled isofemale lines of Drosophila melanogaster that were infected from the tropics. So this line from the northern tropics I'll call trop, and a line, an isofemale line from the temperate south, which I'll call temp. So we reared each of these lines at each temperature. And this allowed us to test questions of adaptation. Are temperate flies in Wolbachia from the south adapted to transmission in the cold relative to, to tropical lines? But we also really wanted to be able to tease out the effects of the host and Wolbachia genome. So to do that, we used back crossing to essentially reciprocally swap the cytoplasms of each isofemale line into the opposing host background. And that's indicated by these superscripts. So for example, this line has the temperate host background with the tropical Wolbachia variant integrased in, and the reciprocal is here. So by rearing each of these lines at each temperature, we can use statistics to tease out Wolbachia host and temperature effects and their potential interactions. So now I'm gonna show you all these data. I've got each temperature and each line here on the x-axis and rates of maternal transmission. And this project, this part of this project was spearhead, spearheaded by Chelsea Caldwell, who was a really extraordinary undergraduate in the lab at the time. And she did literally thousands of PCR reactions measuring if F1s were infected or not with Wolbachia. So she really did a great job um, working these data out across different temperatures. And what Chelsea found is that generally maternal transmission rates decline with temperature from 28 to 25 to 20 C. But we see this really interesting G by G by E interaction effect or host by Wolbachia by temperature effect on maternal transmission. And we'll just kind of walk you through what that means. So at 28 C, transmission was near perfect for all four genotypes. As we decline in temperature to 25 C, transmission slightly declines, but this host effect becomes clear, indicated by these two genotypes, where the temperate host background generally has higher rates of transmission than the tropical host background. As we move to 20 C, transmission generally declines further, but we see this G by G by E interaction effect becoming clear where the specific combination of the temperate host and the temperate Wolbachia genome have uniquely high rate of transmission in the cold relative to the other three genotypes. And this was really exciting because it suggests there's potentially this pattern of co-adaptation where temperate Wolbachia and hosts have sort of co-adapted for increased transmission in a temperate climate. And I'll get back to that in a second, but first I wanna just focus on this main effect of declining temperature. Um, causing transmission decline across different temperatures. So the first thing we wanted to do here with these data was, was test, well, can declining transmission in the cold actually explain this decline in Eastern Australia? So to do that, I use this idealized discrete generation model, which incorporates rates of maternal transmission and how will Bakke influence host fitness and reproduction via cytoplasmic incompatibility and it predicts the equilibrium infection frequency of Wolbachia you would expect in a particular host population. So here I'm gonna pick a population from the south and a population from the north. And the y-axis here is the equilibrium frequency predicted by this model. And the horizontal lines are the observed infection frequencies that we see in these populations in the north and the south. And the goal here is to hold effects on host fitness and reproduction content, constant and see, can we explain variation in infection frequencies solely due to declining maternal transmission in the cold. And it turns out we can. So if we assume estimates of transmission at 20 C in the cold in the south and 28 C in the north, we can explain variation between these two populations by only invoking variation in rates of maternal transmission. 
And this is kind of in contrast to prior work that had sort of speculated in order to explain clinal variation in WML frequencies, you must invoke variation and how will Bakke affect host fitness and how, how they influence reproduction. So this provides sort of a simple explanation for, uh, potentially provides a simple explanation for declining infection frequencies in Australia. And in fact, there's a parallel Wolbachia decline in southeastern United States, where infection frequencies again decl decline at temperate latitudes, and again declining transmission can can do a good job of explaining why infection frequencies might decline at temperate latitudes uh, on on this other continent with a parallel decline. So the next thing we wanted to do was start to drill down to sort of the cellular basis for why maternal transmission might decline in the cold. So here I'm showing you developing oocytes in Drosophila melanogaster. And here's an image of a stage 10 oocyte. These big fluorescent nuclei are host cells. This is the oocyte here, and these little fluorescent puncta are Wolbachia cells. And you'll notice there's this kind of uh, clustering of Wolbachia cells at this northern pole here, this posterior pole. And that's because this is where the host germline develops. So it's thought that if Wolbachia can get to this developing host germline, they're more likely to be incorporated into the host germline and that facilitates high rates of maternal transmission. But also the cell biology of this was again worked out under ideal lab conditions where we know rates of transmission are near perfect. What does this phenotype look like when transmission starts to break down under stressful thermal conditions? So to test this, we looked at Wolbachia abundance in oocytes and specifically uh, at the germline at the pole where the host germline develops to see what does is, what is Wolbachia abundance look like when temperatures decline and transmission breaks down. And this was done in conjunction with uh, another postdoc in the lab, Dylan Shropshire, who did a great job at imaging all these oocytes. And we found that uh, Wolbachia abundance in whole oocytes generally declines but the pattern is, is most strong and clearest at the pole where the host germline develops. We see this decline in Wolbachia abundance from 28 to 25 to 20 C. And this is just quantified here in the whole oocyte and specifically at the posterior. And you can see this clear pattern of declining Wolbachia abundance at the pole across temperatures. Um, so we think declining transmission is the result of declining Wolbachia abundance at the developing host germline and developing oocytes. Okay, so now just to kind of summarize where we're at at this point, we think we've identified sort of potentially a, a cellular explanation for why Wolbachia abundance, why Wolbachia prevalence might decline along this decline at temperate latitudes. Transmission declines in the cold and that seems to be due to declining Wolbachia abundance at the host germline in developing oocytes. So I was really excited to sort of further interrogate this pattern that's kind of indicative of co-adaptation indicated by this G by G by E interaction effect that becomes clear at 20C where the specific combination of the temperate host and the temperate Wolbachia genome has uniquely high rates of transmission in the cold. And when you perturb that relationship between Wolbachia and host, you see lower rates of transmission in the cold. So the next thing I wanted to do is try and tease out how host and Wolbachia factors might potentially contribute to this apparent pattern of co-adaptation in the temperate south. And this, this pattern of uh, increased transmission in the cold is sort of what you would expect from theory. So you would expect combinations of host and Wolbachia that increase rates of transmission and, and subsequently um, it increase the rate of infection spread. So this is sort of what you would expect to be favored by, by selection. So what we did first was look at all four of these genotypes in the cold to look at Wolbachia uh, oocyte abundance, because we hypothesized um, this temperate genotype might have increased transmission in the cold due to the fact that it has higher rates of Wolbachia abundance in the whole oocyte in the pole. So we imaged each of these genotypes at 20C. And what was really surprising is we found very little evidence of the host genome influencing Wolbachia abundance in developing oocytes, but there was this clear effect of the Wolbachia variant. And in particular, the temperate Wolbachia variant indicated by this genotype 
and this genotype occurred at higher abundance in whole oocytes and specifically at the pole. And that's just quantified here and here. So this is potentially uh, indicating that this, this temperate Wolbachia variant occurs at higher oocyte abundance compared to the tropical variant, which is sampled from tropical latitudes. So have, have this, has this tropical WML variant potentially adapted to temperate conditions in the cold to occur at higher oocyte abundance uh, in, in stressful thermal conditions. This was particularly surprising given the evolutionary history of WML Wolbachia in Drosophila melanogaster. So here I'm just showing you a reminder that temperate WML occurs at higher oocyte abundance in the cold than the tropical variant. And all WML Wolbachia variants that infect Drosophila melanogaster share a most recent common ancestor within the last 8,000 years or so. So Wolbachia have very recently spread across the globe in Drosophila melanogaster populations. And in particular, the tropical and temperate WML variants are very, very closely related and are separated by few genomic differences. Uh, so we're really interested in what might explain these differences in oocyte abundance between these temperate and tropical WML variants. And I should mention at this point that you can't culture Wolbachia outside of host cells, so we can't you know, do genetics and manipulate the genome to see what might <clears throat> causally explain this variation. But because these variants are so closely related, we were able to actually zoom in uh, to look at the specific SNPs that distinguish them to try and get an idea of what might explain this potential signature uh, of this pattern that is sort of indicative of Wolbachia adaptation to, to temperature. So the Wolbachia genome is about 1.25 megabases, but there's only 43 SNPs that distinguish the tropical and temperate WML variants. And of those 43 SNPs, uh, 20 are non-synonymous. So 20 produce uh, different amino acids. Of those non-synonymous SNPs, 13 produce non-conservative amino acid changes. So these are uh, amino acid changes that produce uh, different biochemical properties. But one SNP really stands out because it, it produces this disruptive premature stop codon in this gene WSP in the tropical WML variant. And WSP is the major, it encodes the major Wolbachia surface protein B. So this is one of the seven major surface proteins of Wolbachia. And these proteins have sort of long been hypothesized to be involved in host interactions. And WSPB has these long extracellular loops that are thought to be involved in interacting with host cells. And as I mentioned, the tropical WML variant has this uh, highly disruptive premature stop code on right at the beginning of the coding sequence that very clearly pseudogenizes the gene. So we think this can potentially explain why tropical WML occurs at lower abundance in host oocytes. And this stop codon is clearly derived. It's not found in any other Wolbachia strains across 46 million years of, uh, of Wolbachia evolution. So this was pretty interesting because it suggests, well, even though Wolbachia have very, very recently spread across the globe, perhaps there is variation in the Wolbachia genome that's associated with adaptation to thermal conditions. So to more broadly test that hypothesis, we wanted to look at uh, genomic variation in the Wolbachia genome in, in Drosophila melanogaster populations across the globe to see if there's a relationship between temperature and Wolbachia loci. So to do this, we, we leverage this great data set, Drosophila Evolution Over Space and Time, or DEST data set. And that includes pool seek data of Drosophila melanogaster populations from North America and Europe. And we included another data set um, from Australia, from Eastern Australia. And we went into these pool seek uh, samples and basically mined them for Wolbachia reads, for WML reads. <clears throat> and this resulted in about 20,000 WML SNPs in all these different populations scattered across different um, locations at different latitudes. And then we just used these SNPs to test whether any of these SNPs were significantly associated with temperature, annual mean temperature, in all these different populations. So here I'm showing you the top 1% of all Wolbachia SNPs that are associated with temperature in these different populations. It turns out eight of the SNPs that distinguish um, 
our temperate and tropical WML variants are also found in this top 1%, including this WSPB gene, which is the number three associated SNP with temperature across all SNPs in the Wolbachia genome. So we sort of conclude that this surface protein seems to be really important in maintaining Wolbachia abundance in developing host oocytes because in temperate populations, it occurs at higher frequencies. So the, the functional version of this gene in the temperate WML variant occurs at higher frequency in temperate or cooler host populations, including in Australia, where the in Southern temperate Australia, the functional WSP B allele is fixed, and then it declines in frequency as you move north to the tropics. So as I mentioned, we conclude that uh, we think this protein is an important Wolbachia factor in maintaining cellular abundance in the cold. So getting back to uh, this broader question of how do host and Wolbachia factors contribute to this pattern of co-adaptation, we think, at least on the Wolbachia side of things, WSPB is an important factor maintaining oocyte abundance in the cold. To more rigorously uh, test that hypothesis, we sampled additional isofemale lines from the north and the south. So I'm just going to call these temp2 and temp3, trop2 and trop3. And then for those lines, we also measured maternal transmission in the cold. So generally, we see this pattern where uh, lines sampled from the temperate south have higher rates of transmission in the cold than lines sampled from the tropical north. And this sort of generally fits this pattern of co-adaptation that we observed. But what's interesting is if you look at whether or not each of these genotypes, the Wolbachia variant has the functional version of this Wolbachia surface protein B, the two tropical lines that are especially poor transmitting in the cold have the pseudogenized version or the disrupted version of this WSPB gene. But one of the temperate lines that has high rates of transmission in the cold also has a pseudogenized version of this gene. So to us, this really sort of hits home the fact that there's also this interaction with the host genome. And there are also important host factors that also determine variation in maternal transmission. Uh, and this is something we're really interested in uh, trying to understand moving forward. What's this interaction between host and Wolbachia factors that determines rates of maternal transmission in the cold? Okay, so to sum up this second portion of the talk, uh, temperature effects on cellular Wolbachia host interactions seem to determine declining maternal transmission, particularly declining Wolbachia abundance at the host developing host germline in developing oocytes. But we see this G by G by interaction effect that's indicative of really rapid host endosymbiont co-adaptation to the temperate climate in the last tens of thousands of years. And we think at least on the Wolbachia side of things, it's mediated by interactions with this Wolbachia surface protein B. But more broadly, I think what this work sort of hits home is that temperature is a really key determinant of how prevalent Wolbachia are on multiple continents in, in Australia and North America, but also sort of the co-evolutionary trajectory of uh, its relationship with hosts. Okay, so now to kind of bring things home, I started with this idea of integrating our understanding of coevolution across different levels of biological scale, and specifically how does evolution at this molecular interface of species interactions dictate broader patterns of coevolution? So what has, has the work that I've showed you in predator prey and host and endosymbionts told us about this relationship? I think broadly uh, my work for my PhD and my postdoc shows that constraints that we observe at the cellular and molecular level scale up to generate predictable patterns of coevolution at broader uh, biological scales. In the case of the predator-prey arms race, antagonistic pleiotropy and constraints associated with mutations arising in this pore lead to these predictable parallel sequences of amino acid changes in multiple lineages of garter snakes that have convergently evolved escalated resistance. In the case of host and endosymbiont, constraints associated with temperature and the ability of Wolbachia to get to the developing host germline and developing oocytes seem to lead to these predictable clinal patterns of variation in endosymbiont prevalence on multiple continents. So with that, I wanna thank a whole bunch of folks, including a ton of really extraordinary work from undergraduates, uh, in particular, I want to thank my PhD mentor, Butch Brody at the University of Virginia, and 
my current mentor, Brandon Cooper, right now at the University of Montana. I've just been really fortunate to have excellent mentors throughout my career. Um, and I would be happy to take any questions.